Hi, this is Tony Northrup for Train Signal, and in this video lesson, I'm going to go over the Code of Ethics specifically for the SSCP certification exam. First, let's talk about ISC2's own Code of Ethics. They have this very short Code of Ethics that they require everybody who takes any of their exams to agree to. And it's pretty easy. Like, I don't think you're going to be struggling with any of these, but the first is to protect society, the commonwealth, and the infrastructure. And what they mean by that is your, your top priority is to not do anything that would harm your state, your country, or humanity. Uh, you certainly shouldn't do something that would destroy a building or a road system or the telecommunications infrastructure, etc. Act honorably, honestly, justly, responsibly, and legally. And some of these terms are pretty vague. Honorably, I, I don't know, it, that's really a very subjective term. Honestly seems pretty clear. You need to tell the truth and not lie, of course. Justly, again, that's something that is easily pushed to one side or the other, as well as responsibly. The last term, legally, is pretty clear cut, though. Um, however, legally varies depending on what state you're in, what country you're in, what year it is. <laughs> Laws change. And they expect you to do your best to follow the laws of your land. Third, provide diligent and competent service to principals. And what this means is you work for somebody and you should do what they say and you should do your best. Now notice that this is the third in the code of ethics. They think the most important thing is to protect society. And up next, they want you to do what is legal. The third thing is to serve the people that you work for. Therefore, if you're, the people you work for ask you to destroy a building or do something that's illegal, well, their code of ethics would have you pass on that. And I personally agree with that. And in fact, in the past, I've threatened to uh, not work for companies when I thought it was unethical. And I've left projects that I was contracted for because I felt they asked me to do something unethical. And you need to have the same strength to do that. The last is to advance and protect the profession. And this is kind of a proactive thing, but they want you to work with other security people and to do your best to improve security and to make the world a safer place, whether it's computing or personal safety. And I like to think that part of the way I fulfill that last element is by making these types of training videos and trying to spread what I've learned. Now, I believe the certification exam is only going to want you to agree to ISC2's own four code of ethics. But there are some other common ethical models around the IT security world, and I'd like to cover them. This is from the Washington Consulting Group and the Computer Ethics Institute. Um, and they're pretty popular and pretty commonly understood. And you can see they follow this Ten Commandments structure, and they kind of are written in Old English. But the lessons that they're trying to teach are very valid. Up first, thou shalt not use a computer to harm other people. Pretty self-explanatory, though the word harm can be kind of vague. It doesn't just mean using your computer to fly a drone into a building and physically harm somebody. But if you were to cause financial harm to somebody, stealing their credit card number and abusing it, well, you'd be harming somebody. Um, you might also be harming somebody if you were to pirate some software or other intellectual property. Number two, thou shalt not interfere with other people's computer work. And that seems pretty specifically targeted towards denial of service attacks. So don't mess with people's computers or send them ping bombs. Just even if you don't agree with what they're doing, don't do it. Number three, thou shalt not snoop in other people's computer files. <laughs> and this is something that uh, I think many IT people break because we often have access to email and files and sometimes there's stuff we really want to see in there. And I'll, I'll tell you one time when I personally struggled with this. I, I worked for a small healthcare company and one day I had to go in and fix something on the CEO's computer. And it was on a weekend because uh, he couldn't be bothered, right? <laughs> <laughs> so he had to come in over the weekend to fix his computer. And when I got into his computer, his email popped up and there was nobody else in the office. And there was a, a message and the subject of the message was something like Tony's review. <laughs> it was literally about me and it was from my manager to the president covering uh, my work and what they thought of me and whether I might be getting a raise. And I 
definitely could have read that message without any trace of it. All I had to do was open it and then right click it and click mark unread and I didn't do it. So I feel good because if I had done that I would still be carrying that around with me um, and as an IT guy I've been faced with that same conundrum hundreds of times over and we all will. And just don't do it. Just give people their privacy and hope that they give you that same respect. Number four, thou shalt not use a computer to steal. And for me, this overlaps with number one because anytime you steal, you're taking away from somebody else and you're harming them. Even if you think you're not harming them, well, number four covers any sort of intellectual property theft, things like pirating music or movies. That's stealing. Number five, thou shalt not use a computer to bear false witness. And again, they're really trying hard to, <laughs> to use this kind of old English style, but what they're saying is you won't pretend to be somebody else. You won't spoof an IP address or spoof an email message. Any of us could make a message come from Obama at the White House .gov and send it to any of our friends. Email is extremely easy to spoof, but don't do it. It's wrong. Thou shalt not copy or use proprietary software for which you have not paid. So I think they're really hitting this piracy thing hard. You get it. Number seven, thou shalt not use other people's computer resources without authorization or proper compensation. I don't know why it doesn't say authorization and proper compensation because you can't use somebody's computer without them authorizing you and then pay them for it. That's not fair. You need, it should say authorization and proper compensation, I think. But what this means is don't hack into somebody's computer and store your files on it. Don't set up a botnet. <laughs> and if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. But if you do know it, don't do it, okay? Number eight, thou shalt not appropriate other people's intellectual output. I will tell you another short story where somebody violated this rule against me. I was a contractor for a company and they asked me to design um, one of the very first web hosting platforms based on Windows for a web hosting company. And I was a contractor and my contract was supposed to expire at the end of the week and I wrote this like 60 page engineering document outlining every aspect of the operating system design for their web hosting platform. And then they renewed my contract. So I come in Monday and there's a big meeting about it and I was not invited but somebody grabbed me in the hallway and they're like, oh, you should be in this meeting. So I go in there and the person I'd been working for was handing out my 60 page thing with her name on the cover and no mention of me whatsoever and she had not changed a single word of it. She just thought I was leaving and she could take credit for my work. That felt bad for me and it was ter terrible of her to do. So don't do that. Don't take somebody else's work and claim it as your own. Number nine, thou shalt think about the social consequences of the program you are writing or the system you are designing. Wow, this is a big one, right? If you're writing a calculator app, well, what are the social consequences? Probably nothing. But on the other hand, if you're writing a really addictive game, something that could distract people from their personal and family lives or their work lives, that could have social consequences, right? What if you're working for the military? Do they expect you to assess whether the app that you're writing that's going to control a drone's movement will be used wrongly? That seems like a really tough one. I, I don't know how to address that, but take that for what you will. And at least think about what you're doing even when you're just working for somebody else. Number 10, thou shalt always use a computer in ways that ensure consideration and respect for your fellow humans. That's pretty vague, but try to always do the right thing and think about other people. Up next, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes going over the unified framework of professional ethics for security professionals. And I'm just going to give you the highlights, but if you want to see the whole thing, go to the URL on the screen, ethics-wg.org. The first domain of their framework is integrity. And it states, perform duties in accordance with existing laws, exercising the highest moral principles. Refrain from activities that would constitute a conflict of interest. So I think the first part of the statement is, pretty obvious. Laws and morals. <laughs> you probably know what those are. Follow them. Let's talk about what a conflict of interest is. A conflict of interest is any situation where you might stand to benefit or profit, but the people you're interacting with 
can't understand it. They don't have insight into your potential for benefit. So let's say that I had a bunch of Microsoft stock and I was doing this video training lesson. I could perhaps be steering you in the direction of using Microsoft products. I could be saying, well, Microsoft products are a little more secure than Mac OS or Linux. That would be a conflict of interest if I didn't disclose that I have some Microsoft stock. And for the record, I don't have stock in any IT company. And as far as I know, I don't have any particular conflict of interest. I have done a lot of work for Microsoft and Microsoft Press, but I've been pretty open and public about that. And I don't get a single dollar if somebody buys Windows or doesn't. So there's no way for me to benefit from that. They also want you to act in the best interest of stakeholders consistent with public interest. So it's kind of conflicting. Like your stakeholders are basically your bosses, right? They want you to do what your bosses want. As long as it doesn't conflict with public interest, as long as your bosses don't want you to harm somebody in some way or steal something. Act honorably, justly, responsibly, and legally in every aspect of your profession. And while most of those terms are vague, I think you understand what they mean. Their next domain is objectivity. Perform all duties in a fair manner and without prejudice. Exercise independent professional judgment in order to provide unbiased analysis and advice. And again, they, they want to make sure that you are being fair, that you don't have any particular biases. For example, in a very literal way, it could be Microsoft versus Linux, or it could be your own product versus somebody else's. If somebody asks for advice and your product happens to be the best one, well, tell them first it's your product and you stand and make a buck off of it if they buy it. But second, tell them why you think it's the best one and do it honestly. If you think your competitor's product might be better, well, they want you to say your competitor's product is better. And maybe you shouldn't get into sales once you agree to do this. When an opinion is provided, note it is an opinion rather than fact. This is almost like journalism, right? Or the legal profession. If something is hearsay, you have to note that it was hearsay. If you're in a court case and a witness testifies that they saw Johnny at the store at 1030, well, the record doesn't say Johnny was at the store at 1030. The record says the witness testified that Johnny was at the store at 1030. It's not a matter of fact, it's a matter of testimony. And whether you believe Johnny was at the store or not depends on how trustworthy that witness is. And if somebody is asking you whether Unix is better than Windows, well, you can say, I think Unix is better than Windows, but you can't necessarily say Unix is more secure than Windows because that is largely an opinion because security is such a tough thing to assess. Now, you could say the Windows build takes up more megabytes than the Unix build. That could be a fact. I don't know if that's true. It depends on the Unix build, I suppose. But that's the difference between an opinion and a fact. And there will be many times in your career when somebody asks your opinion and you have the opportunity to present it as a fact, as something that you know, rather than something that you think. So to understand the difference and always be clear. The third domain of the unified framework of professional ethics for security professionals, professional competence and due care. I think we all know how to do a good job, right? Perform your services diligently and with professionalism. Act with diligence and promptness in rendering servants. So do your best. Respond quickly. These are all things my dad taught me, so I'll pass them on to you. Render only those services for which you are fully competent and qualified. Now, okay. Now, this is something I feel really passionately about because I run into people who don't do this so often. <laughs> so often. In fact, I just had to fire a web developer that was working for me because they signed up for a job that they didn't have the technical skills for. They took on a fairly complex task and they only had beginner level web development skills, but they told me they could handle it. They told me they'd handled similar things in the past and frankly, they were lying. And this happens all the time. Many people take on jobs that are too big for them and then they end up failing. And it costs the person who hired you dearly. It costs them a lot. They were kind enough to hire you, give you a chance and give you money and you messed up their life, right? So don't do that. Now, this is something that I do all the time and people are actually taken aback by it. Somebody will come to me and they'll be like, I do a lot of writing. So they'll come to me and they'll say, hey, Tony, can you write a book on this topic? We'll give you a big wad of money. 
And I'll say, no, I can't. That's not in my field of expertise. I can do this and this and this, but I can't do these other things, even if they want to give me a lot of money. <laughs> I have to always be honest about what I'm doing. And sometimes my answer is, yes, I can do it, but I haven't done it before. So I will do my best on it and I'm good at picking up new technologies, but it's a brand new thing for me. So you have to understand that I'm not going to have 10 years of experience in it. And you know what? More often than not, the honest approach works and the person will come back and say, okay, we understand you haven't worked with this before, but we know your work and we know your ethic. So we're going to give you the project anyway. Just tell people exactly how much experience you have. Don't exaggerate your experience and don't take work that you're not qualified for. Up next, ensure that work performed meets the highest professional standards. Where resource constraints exist, ensure that your work is both correct and complete within those limits. If, in your professional judgment, resources are inadequate to achieve an acceptable outcome, so inform clients and principals. And just a story from every day of my life, because we're always working under resource constraints, right? Somebody asked me to write a 10-page paper in a week. I'll say, okay, I can write a 10-page paper in a week, but it's not going to be a great paper. <laughs> the best I can give you is an okay paper because I don't have much time to work on it because I can't make a lot of calls or do a lot of research or set up and test stuff. So what I can do is I can make educated guesses about things and be clear about that in the paper, but I don't have time to build a lab environment and test every step of it. Just an example. And as the last sentence here says, if in your professional judgment the resources are inadequate to achieve an acceptable outcome, tell your bosses or tell the people you're working for that, even if the resources are low and it's your fault. Sometimes I'm running late on a project and it's entirely my fault. Maybe I was distracted on another project and I'm not going to hit the deadline. I'll tell people I can get it done by this day, but I would have to rush and give you a mediocre paper. I'm going to have to be late if I'm going to give you a good paper. If somebody has assigned you a hardware budget of $10,000 and you need to buy some computers to run a server, and halfway through the project you realize that server is not going to be up to par or you forgot to buy some networking equipment or something, you have to be upfront about it. You just have to admit your mistake and do it as soon in the process as you can. The last statement on this page, be supportive of colleagues and encourage their professional development. Recognize and acknowledge the contributions of others and respect the decisions of principals and coworkers. And I genuinely believe in this one too. I believe in helping other people. And now I've written 30 books. I've also gotten about eight or nine of my friends to write books. Basically anybody who ever expressed an interest in writing a book, I helped them do it. I made connections for them. I gave them advice. I gave them free editing. And you know, I've been doing this for 15 years and it's always paid off for me. I always try to help people out. And in the end, they appreciate it and they respect you. And you know what? You learn from it too. Um, the last part is something very few people get right, I think. Respect the decisions of principals and coworkers. And especially in the IT industry, I think we all tend to be a little bit arrogant. We all think we really know what we're doing. And in particular, how often have you been chatting with your coworkers and they say that they think your boss is an idiot? <laughs> this happens all the time. The so-called water cooler talk, people would be like, God, the bosses are such dummies. If I was a CEO, I would do this and this and that. Well, that is not respecting the decisions of principals and coworkers. And I don't mean you should bite your tongue and not say bad things. I mean you should acknowledge that they have skill sets that are different than you and they might know more than you. They might also have more information than you. So, for example, I spent much of my IT career working at a company called BBN, Bolt, Bernack, and Newman. And it was in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is where MIT and Harvard both are two of the best schools in the world. And all my bosses were their engineers with a PhD from MIT, or they were Harvard MBAs. And I got the MIT guys pretty well because they were engineers too. It took me a few years to really appreciate the skill set of the Harvard MBAs. And time and time again, when I was a youngin and just starting out, I thought my Harvard MBA bosses were doing incredibly stupid things. But I worked hard and I worked my way up into the organization to the point where I was working side by side with these Harvard MBAs 
And that's when I really developed a true respect for their knowledge. And I realized that many of the decisions that I thought they were making incorrectly, because they didn't have the technical skills that I had, I realized they were making the right decision because they had skills completely outside of my skill set, because they had marketing and strategy and financial and accounting skills, because they understood partnerships and supply and demand and all these business things. Now, what I'm getting at here is that your bosses might know more than you do. They certainly have more insight into the inner workings of the company and with additional information, a logical person can make a better and more informed decision. And that means your bosses might not be as dumb as you think they are. How about you give them the benefit of the doubt? I'll also say that I try to give my coworkers and peers the benefit of the doubt as much as possible, even when I think they might be doing something wrong. Well, I've been proven wrong time and time and time again. And you just need to feel like a dummy a few times when you get into an argument with somebody and you insist you're right, and then you end up being wrong. Well, we're all wrong sometimes, right? Well, nowadays I hardly take such a hard stance. I almost never to think that somebody else is wrong when I disagree with them. I think one of us is wrong. <laughs> it could be me, it could be them. Let's work together to figure out which the right answer is and maybe we even explore both paths if that's even possible. But your coworkers are smart and your bosses are smart, so give them some respect. Some more bullet points under the same heading. Keep the stakeholders informed regarding the progress of your work. And that's pretty obvious, right? But we've all known the guy who has a project due in one month and you ask him for an update two weeks in and he's like, none of your business, so I'll get back to you when it's due. Don't do that. Just keep people informed of the progress. Other people are really good at managing your progress. They need to know that you're working on time. Give them status updates. Do it in good faith. And if you're running late on something, tell them about it. If you're struggling with something, tell them about it. Don't keep stuff secret because you're afraid it's going to make you look bad. Refrain from conduct which would damage the reputation of the profession or the practice of colleagues, clients, and employers. I feel like that's covered in the other points. Anything you do that might embarrass your coworkers or the company that you work for is probably falling into the category of unethical or unprofessional. Report ethical violations to the appropriate governing body in a timely manner. Whoa, this is a really, really big point. What this means is if your boss, if your company asks you to do something illegal, you need to call law enforcement. You need to call the police or the FBI or whoever it is, and turn them in. So that's pretty huge, right? And you know, you don't need to immediately call. The way I would handle it is, once they ask me to do something illegal, I'd say, hey, okay, we need to check this out. Can I talk to the legal department and just make sure that this is okay? Because this seems wrong. When I was in college, I worked at a lot of different law firms and one of those law firms at one point asked me to do something illegal. My boss, who was standing right next to me, started hiding evidence and he was like, here, grab this and throw it in the corner. And I didn't know what to do. <laughs> so I grabbed it and I threw it in the corner. And as soon as we got back to the office, I, I went to his boss and I said, I think I did something wrong. I wasn't sure. I was, I was a kid. I wasn't sure at the time that it was illegal, but it sure felt wrong. And that's why I wanted to follow up. And I talked to my boss's boss and he said, uh, yeah, that's destroying evidence. <laughs> that's pretty illegal. <laughs> so he talked to my boss and we together went back and we brought it back in such a way that it was allowed back into the chain of custody, even though it didn't serve our needs. The statute of limitations has passed on that. So I feel like I can finally tell that story. <laughs> but that was a ethical conundrum for me. And at the time, I didn't have enough information to know that it was wrong. But I followed up with my boss. I found out what was right. And I feel like we restored balance. The last point on this page, participate in learning throughout your career to maintain these skills necessary to function effectively as a member of the profession. Just keep studying stuff like you are now, but don't stop. Subscribe to some magazines, get on some security blogs, keep researching, stay ahead of the curve. Because you can't just learn this and pass a certification and know what you're going to need to know. Security is maybe the most dynamic field out there. Attacks are constantly evolving, countermeasures are evolving, so you got to stay on top of it. The next element is confidentiality, and this is really a no-brainer. 
Respect and safeguard confidential information and exercise due care to prevent improper disclosure. So just try your best not to spill secrets. <laughs> Don't tell things to people. This is something, my dad was always really good at this. My dad was in the Air Force for a long time and then he went into the private sector as an engineer designing things largely for uh, government contracts. And when he got home from work, I'd ask him what he did during the day and he would say, I, I'm sorry, I, I can't tell you. <laughs> and that went on for my whole childhood. And then one day he came to me and he said, you know how I couldn't ever tell you what I was working on? He said, well, I can finally tell you what I did today. <laughs> he said he was designing a hard valve for a pacemaker. And he was so happy that he was working on something not confidential for once and he could finally talk about his day. He was really committed. So confidentiality means different things to different people, but to me confidentiality means keeping secrets even from the people close to you, your spouses and your children. Because you never know who those people are going to talk to and you wouldn't even want to burden them with a secret. Um, I'll, I'll point out that the um, second clause here says maintain confidentiality unless such action would conceal or result in the commission of a criminal act is otherwise required by law or authorized by the principal. So in other words, there are times when you have to break confidentiality. For example, in the medical profession, there's client-patient privilege unless you think that your patient is going to harm somebody else or themselves, in which case you are legally obligated to break that confidentiality in some cases. So that's just an example of, of when it's necessary to break confidentiality. And, you know, if you think your company is systematically doing something illegal and nobody internally is going to deal with it, you might be legally obligated to break the confidentiality and, and take it to law enforcement. Let's talk about hacking. <laughs> I have a long and storied history with hacking and I've never really been on the bad side of it, but you know, I started with computers back in the early 80s. I started in 1983 when I was nine years old. And um, I was logging into BBSs before the internet really took off and became popular. Um, you know, I always subscribed to 2600 Magazine and I consider myself a security guy, but you know, my dad really raised me right and I never had the guts to do anything really bad. So I'd like to go over the different types of hacking and the ethical implications of each. The only type of hacking I ever want to see you involved in is white hat hacking. This goes back to the old cowboy movies, I suppose, where the bad guys wore the black hat and you know the Lone Ranger had a white hat. This is ethical hacking, sometimes called tiger teams, and it's super, super, super fun because you get to hack without any danger without getting in trouble, without hurting anybody, without doing anything illegal. This doesn't actually happen all that often, but as a form of auditing, some companies will hire a tiger team to go in and try to expose vulnerabilities. And if you can get your company to allow you to do it to your own systems, well, it's about the most fun you can have because <laughs> you get to get your hands a little bit dirty. You get to find all these sniffing tools to assess your environment and find out which ports are open and which software is outdated and where existing vulnerabilities might be. You get to poke your head around in hackforums.net and other CD places where you find the tools that hackers actually use. Anyway, it's one of my favorite things to do and you're doing it to protect your organization and sometimes it can even help you comply with regulatory requirements. So white hat hacking is doing just about anything but you're doing it with permission and on systems that you own. Not you personally but your organization. Just the systems that they've authorized you to attack and generally they'll have given a heads up to the people responsible for managing those systems gray hat hacking. Now before I go into gray hat hacking, I'll say the bad type of hacking is called black hat hacking. So gray hat is somewhere in between white hat and gray hat. And it's wrong. Don't do gray hat hacking. By definition, gray hat hacking might or might not be illegal. It might or might not be well-meaning, but it's not selfish. The hacker isn't profiting from it. Often it's simply scanning a host without getting the authorization of the owner of the system. You can do a port scan on a system that you don't own and it'll tell you what ports are listening. And well, that's gray hat hacking. You didn't get their permission. You're 
poking them, you didn't actually break anything, at least not intentionally, but you didn't do it with permission. So it's gray hat and you shouldn't do it. Often gray hat hackers scan systems and find vulnerabilities and then they'll send a message to the people who own the system offering to fix the system. So they might scan a public website and then they'll say, hey, I noticed that your system is vulnerable to this and this attack. If you'd like, I can go in and fix it for you for a fee. That's gray hat hacking. I don't think that's the right thing to do. Why are you going out and just scanning systems that nobody's asked you to scan? So I don't think of it as ethical and, and generally the IT security community doesn't think of gray hat hacking as ethical. Now let's talk about black hat hacking. Flat hat hacking is usually illegal, though illegal is kind of vague, right? Because it might be illegal in the United States and it might be legal in some other country. Uh, and in fact, a lot of hackers will go to countries where it's legal because there they can do stuff and escape any sort of prosecution. Different places have different laws. So saying flat hat hacking is illegal makes it a little imprecise because it would mean you could just move to a different location and suddenly you wouldn't be a black hat anymore. Black hat hacking is certainly unethical and it's usually done for any kind of personal gain other than the paycheck of somebody who's hiring you. Anytime you elevate your privileges without authorization, well that's black hat hacking and that includes installing a bot on somebody's computer, uh, accessing somebody's files without permission, and I don't mean they've left their files unprotected and you go in and browse. That's still black hat. If somebody assigns the everybody group read access to all of their files and you go poking around their files, even though they haven't said, hey, please take a look at my files, that's black hat. You can't do that. Somebody's oversight, somebody's misconfiguration doesn't give you permission to go in just as it doesn't give you permission to go into somebody's house if they leave their front door unlocked, even if they intentionally leave it unlocked. You can go into somebody's house if they say, hey, come on into my house. So that's the difference. And if you go into any computer system uninvited, it's a black hat activity and misconfiguration is not an invitation. Remember that. Uh, it's also a black hat activity if you discover a vulnerability and you hide it from your employer. Think of it this way. If you're a developer and you're writing code and you realize you messed something up but it would take you an extra week to fix it, you got to tell your boss. If you don't, well, that's black hat and it's definitely unethical. Lately, black hat hackers have been finding vulnerabilities just like the gray hat hackers do, but rather than just offering their services for a fee, well, they'll extort the person. This happens a lot in the consumer world with malware. What will happen is malware will install itself on the computer and then up pops a notification that says, you seem to have malware, we can remove it for a fee. Well, that's extortion. It's illegal and it's unethical and it's black hat hacking, so please don't do that. <laughs> Defacing websites is black hat. You know what? Even if you don't agree with the website, if they have a different political stance than you, even if they themselves are clearly unethical, it doesn't make it okay for you to go in and deface your website. I'll give you an example from a friend of mine who is definitely at times a black hat hacker and something that he or she did that was illegal and bad even though they had somehow justified it to themselves that it wasn't so bad. They'd set up a botnet on some unprotected computers just around the world, say 100 or 200 computers, and they'd installed some software on them that would do some extra processing. So there, there are sites on the web where if you need numbers crunched or videos rendered or something, you can just rent other people's processor time and their computers are being unused anyway but left on and it just sends out these little jobs to the computers and they process it and send it back. So he hacked all these systems which you can do with just scripts and then basically sold the processor time. So that's clearly Black Hat and his justification was, well, all they're doing is crunching some numbers, I don't know, it could be used to cure cancer or something. He was making a few bucks from it though. So it was illegal because he was elevating his privileges, he didn't have authorization to access their systems, and he was doing it for personal gain. So even though he was saying nobody got hurt, it's clearly black hat. And as an addendum to that story, he later found out that the uh, bots that he had installed were being used to take com people's computers 
offline. Basically, if, if you're in World of Warcraft and somebody pisses you off, well, you look up their IP address and then you can pay a few bitcoins, which is like an online currency, to have all these different bots flood this one guy's IP address with traffic, taking them offline. Clearly black hat, right? But he thought it was just gray hat because nobody was being hurt in his mind. So that's one example of a moral conundrum. Let's go over a few more. Your coworker has done something illegal. What should you do? Should you immediately call law enforcement? Should you tell your boss? Are you being a rat when this happens? I would certainly talk to the coworker. Uh, you might even explain that you are legally and ethically obligated to respond to the fact that you know that they did something illegal and give them a chance to rectify it. It gets a little trickier when your employer is doing something illegal, right? After all, they're writing your checks <laughs> and uh, you turning them into the police probably won't make you the employee of the month. So what do you do? Well, I would handle it in the same way. I would talk to my employer about it and say, look, I can't work for you. And in fact, if you keep doing this, I can't keep this knowledge to myself. I can't be a party to this. Often there's a conflict between corporate and customer interest. And this has happened time and time again. For example, there were a couple of major retailers, huge, huge retailers. Just think of those really big stores that you see in strip malls and their credit card databases got hacked. So that anybody who'd purchased something, well, they kept a record of that credit card number and they didn't protect it very well. <laughs> I don't know why they kept a record of your credit card number, but they did. It happened to me. I was one of the customers whose credit card numbers got exposed and somebody hacked into their databases, stole the credit card numbers and then sold them online to people who were going to abuse them. They found out about it and you know how they responded? They tried to cover it up. That's not the right thing to do. <laughs> so this is one case where the people who discovered the break-in had a moral conundrum between what would benefit the company and what would benefit the customer. So clearly it benefited the company to keep it a secret, right? At least in the short term. But the customer had the right to know because their credit card numbers were going to be abused. And the banks certainly had a right to know because they were the ones who were going to end up absorbing the cost if there was any sort of fraud. So I think they made the wrong choice. But it can be difficult to choose between your boss's priorities and your customer's priorities. Um, let's talk about forced inoculation. If you're familiar with worms, a, a worm is a little bit of software that installs itself on a computer by exploiting a vulnerability. It elevates privileges. It's running on a computer without permission. And then after it gets installed, well, it goes about finding other computers with a similar vulnerability and installing itself on them. So it spreads around networks this way and it spreads around the entire internet. And for example, the code red worm got installed on millions of computers while I was actively out working the job trying to manage them. And one of the things my coworkers and I kicked around was the idea of modifying the code red worm to spread, but remove the code red worm. So we wanted to simply modify the existing worm to exploit the same vulnerability, but patch the computers and then uninstall itself after spreading to a few other computers. That's a process called forced inoculation. And it, it is a conundrum because if you think the ends justify the means, well, it works out okay. But it definitely makes you black hat through the criteria that I outlined earlier. You're elevating privileges. You're accessing people's computing resources without their permission. And that's illegal and it's unethical. So even though the ends might justify the means in some cases, in this case, it's bad. Hacktivism is a, another moral conundrum. And hacktivism is the process of trying to right a wrong using your hacking tools. This happens all the time. There's some big corporation who does something evil. Let's just say it's clearly evil. And then Anonymous or some other hacking group will break into it and deface the website. They'll express their own interests. Well, again, you could say that the ends justify the means, but you could also take the stance that how do we really know that that person's wrong and I'm right? Well, no matter how confident you are, you can't get around the fact that this process required you to elevate your privileges and access a computer that you weren't authorized to, and therefore it's wrong. Uh, a real tempting one is retaliation, also known as a 
hack back. Somebody hacks into your system and what's the first thing you want to do? Get back at them, right? This happens all the time with these like online games. Two people will be like duking it out in Halo or something else and somebody, well they probably said something terrible into the mic and <laughs> made the other guy mad. So he gets a DDoS attack and takes the other guy's connection offline and that guy's like, well, I'll show him. I can do the same thing. And even if somebody does that to you, you can't strike back. You can't sink to their level. Again, if what they did was wrong, it doesn't make it right. If you do it, two wrongs don't make it right. Anyway, retaliation, hackbacks, hacktivism, force inoculation, all that clearly falls into black hat for me, not even gray hat, so just stay away from it. This is Tony Northrup for Train Signal, and thanks so much for watching this video lesson.